Welcome to The Honest Channel. I'm Claire Johnston, a journalist on a mission to discover how to age well, look and feel good for longer and share this with you. And one of the most overlooked aspects of ageing well can be our bone health. It's something that's fundamental to our longevity and health span and yet we may not be fully aware of how best to preserve it. But with one in three women and one in five men over 50 estimated to suffer bone fragility fractures in their lifetimes, the risk from not taking steps to protect our bones are high. So to talk us through what we need to know and do, I'm joined by one of the UK's most respected and experienced dietitians, Dr. Carrie Ruxton. She's a fellow Scot who's been involved in more than 75 peer-reviewed research papers across her career. And she also works with organizations and industry bodies, including the Health and Food Supplements Information Service, Quality Meat Scotland and the Nutrition Society. And as we're about to hear from Dr. Carrie, while many of us only start thinking about our bone health in later life, there's very good reason to begin as early as possible. Carrie, I'm so pleased to be introducing you to my audience because I've spoken to you many times over the years in journalism uh, to get your expert input into a range of, of nutrition related topics and you're always so well researched um, and I know very much respected for what you bring to the profession so thank you for being here. It's okay it's good to be here Claire. So we're talking today about bone health um, and I think it's one of these issues that most of us become very aware of as we age but aren't necessarily clear on the best ways to maintain the health of our bones um, or how detrimental it can be to us to not protect them. So can we start just by looking at some of the consequences of not supporting our bone health as we age. I mean, what are some of the biggest risk factors in our lifestyles and what can that lead to? Bone health is something which I think many of us don't think about until we have that horrible telltale sign when we're older, like, you know, you you do something which is relatively, you know, minor, like maybe just fall over or something like that. And then you just end up with a, a fracture. And you're thinking, my goodness, you know, that, that wouldn't have happened when I was younger. So definitely um, we, uh, we are almost blindsided by um, bone fragility just creeping up on us. And how does that happen? So when we're young and we're, you know, young kids and, and young people are generally very physically active. You know, you can't keep your, your, your toddler still. They're jumping and running around. They're very flexible bones are growing and developing all of those years. And in fact, bones don't stop developing until mid twenties in, in a lot of people, particularly men, men's bones age a little bit um, more slowly. So they're peaking off at around about mid twenties, whereas women will peak off in the early twenties. And what's happening is that your bones are a little bit like a, a sponge, but the holes gradually get filled up with minerals, particularly calcium, Things like magnesium, phosphorus all, are all in our bones and they get hard over time. And then you reach something called your peak bone mass. And then you normally have quite a few decades of stability. But then the trouble happens with us women when we get to the menopause. And in the menopause, our hormones are changing. We're starting to get a decline in, in certain hormones like estrogen and estrogen is protective to bones. So what then happens in our um, perimenal, perimenopausal period is our bones then start to leak out minerals and we're losing that bone density. And you can see that happening if you measure uh, your bones and you get a, a bone mineral density scan at, at various points in your body, either femur or at the hip, you will start to see a decline. That becomes a problem when it gets to the point where you then have weaknesses in your bones, you then top that with a fall or a knock and you will get a fracture. And then the bone finds it difficult to recover. So in, for example, if we've got any elderly grannies or aunties who've maybe had the most common one is a hip fracture or head of humerus, which is up here, they will have a fracture and then they just won't recover from it and they'll be stuck in hospital for ages. And of course, lying still doesn't help your bones either. 
and then they get complications. And in fact, a shocking fact is, is that um, I can't remember the exact stat, but it's a relatively large percentage of very elderly people that will go into hospital with a fracture will actually die um, after that uh, from complications. They never get back to their homes. So we must do everything possible to try not to get into that situation. We don't want our bones to decline so much. We can slow it down with our physical activity and diet. We also want to have the best possible peak bone mass. And that is all about building up the nutrients and the physical activity in youth so that we peak at a higher level. Um, because that then gives you more wiggle room when you go into the decline. We think about bone health being something that we have to protect when we get older. And you're saying that younger people actually need to be thinking about this, that, that exercising and lifestyle is something we should be maintaining from a, a young age to buy ourselves some, some mileage, basically. I mean, at what stage in life is it really menopause years that we will actually develop osteoporosis? What, what's the tipping point for that in, in that, you know, is it, is it inevitable in most of us or is there particular genetic factor? Um, I mean, how, how does that pan out for most people? There's, def there's definitely a genetic factor. As with many chronic conditions, it's about the dice getting loaded and you abusing your body and health over many decades and then some sort of trigger. So in osteoporosis, if you've got family members, close family members who have got osteoporosis or who've had fractures when they've you know slightly tripped over the stair you want to be worried and thinking my goodness I, I could be in that position I need to do something about it then there's also lifestyle so we we haven't really got onto that yet and, and no doubt we will but things like you know um, poor diet not getting enough of the bone health nutrients which we'll, we'll talk about in a moment lack of exercise I mean that is one of the biggest ones we're given these recommendations by WHO for for children have to have um, an hour of exercise a day and adults it's half an hour most days of the week and that is like exercise when you're out of breath and yet the majority of adults don't even do that. So they're just doing the absolute minimum. And moving your body isn't just about muscles and weight management. Every time you um, you walk or run um, or jump up and down or do any sort of impact type exercise, your bones are reacting to that by building more strength. And so they will automatically strengthen themselves. But the, the converse is true too. So if you're just spending your time sitting on your, your your bum in front of the telly, flicking the channels, having food ordered in and avoiding walking everywhere, driving everywhere, your bones will think, right, okay, we don't need to be strong. We're just going to leak out all that mineral. So it, it's really about taking action during your whole life. Um, so that's the kind of the second point. And then the third one is obviously bumps, knocks, trips, which we, I don't think we can really do anything to avoid those. We can't wrap ourselves up in cotton wool. So, you know, if you're, if you're a middle-aged woman, you know, don't stop running around and jumping around and doing, you know, hill walking or whatever, whatever it is you love. Keep doing it. Just don't um, neglect your health in the intervening uh, years since uh, your youth. So from a dietary perspective, what are the best foods to protect our bone health? Yeah, so there's a, there's a family of nutrients that we need for good bone health. And the biggest one is obviously calcium, because most of the, the calcium in our bodies is in our bones and teeth. And some of it's um, circulating in our blood. Now, the body has to keep the blood levels of all, all nutrients and substances uh, within very, very tight ranges. So what happens is if you then start to um, to lose calcium in your blood for any reason, if you're using it up or you have a greater need, then the bones will be the first port of call for pulling some of that calcium in. So we want to have calcium in our diets, I would say on a daily basis, because you don't want to leave it for a long period of time and have a decline in, in blood, which then needs your bones to get uh, tapped to bring it in. So you've got calcium, uh, the second one that's most vital is vitamin D because calcium can't do its job. It can't actually get into the bone matrix without the vitamin D. 
And I've seen studies where they've given people calcium tablets without any vitamin D, and it hasn't had any impact on bone mineral density. So you do need them together. Other nutrients are things like um, magnesium and phosphorus, which are also minerals. And uh, protein, so if you've got very, very, very low protein diets so or you're not eating well, that's also going to have an impact on your bones. And then vitamin C, which is very important for collagen, which is not just in our skins, but collagen is a, an, an elastic type tissue that holds the bone structure together. So it's not a hard mineral, it's a vitamin, but it is, nece it is necessary for good bone health. So where do you get these? So obviously the the big one for, for calcium is dairy products, your milk, your yogurt, your cheese, uh, kefir, things like that. But you can also get them in plant sources to a lesser extent. So obviously dairy is the best by far. Things like green leafy vegetables. So that's your Brussels sprouts, your cabbage, kale, and also nuts and seeds. So a lot of products are becoming more fortified with calcium. So if you are vegan, or avoiding dairy products and you're taking a plant milk, then have a check of the label to make sure that it is fortified with calcium uh, and iodine as well. Although, although iodine is not necessary for, for bones, it is an important mineral. So check the labels for fortification. With vitamin D, uh, we can actually make vitamin D from sunlight. Not at this time of year in Scotland, Carrie. <laughs> But during um, during April to October, um, if you're out and about, and you only need to be out and about exposing your face and arms for about 15 minutes um, a day before you put the usual sun cream on and protect yourself. Um, so that's enough to kind of give most of us um, a dose of vitamin D for the summer. But food sources over the winter, uh, obviously oily fish, so salmon, mackerel, um, herring, uh, is, is a good source and also things like eggs. Eggs are actually one of the few natural sources of vitamin D. You can take a vitamin D supplement and in fact I think that is absolutely essential if you live in Scotland and the recommended amount is 10 micrograms a day but I've seen studies where that is too low for people living in the northern hemisphere and I think personally I would recommend 25 micrograms a day. If you have not been eating well and you think that your vitamin D levels in your blood are very low, you might have to take 50 to 100 micrograms. But it's probably best if you really are very concerned about your vitamin D to consult a, a dietitian before you take the high dose supplements. But certainly you can take up to 100 safely every day. Um, and that is within the, the tolerance for safe upper, upper limits. Yeah. And then you've got magnesium and phosphorus. Um, so you get magnesium in green leafy vegetables, um, whole grain rice, um, beans, pulses, bananas, that kind of thing. Um, phosphorus is from protein foods. So that's your meat, fish, eggs. And then vitamin C is your fruit and veg. Your glass, daily glass of orange juice gives you 80% of your vitamin C recommendation. So it's, it's everything that we would recommend in a healthy, balanced diet. Yeah, yeah. And that's it. I mean, it's... Um... It's trying to stay away from these processed foods as much as we can, really, isn't it? And eating just whole, whole natural foods at the end of the day. So if you think about your plant milks, you know, for people who are vegan, then they've got no alternative but to mm -hmm. have a fortified um, milk. So that um, gets um, hammered for being an ultra processed food. But I think there's absolutely no problem with it whatsoever. And it's, uh, it's doing us some good. Yeah. Pick your processes. And you mentioned protein there, which is an interesting one, because uh, advice really does vary around how much protein we need um, to maintain, you know, that strong muscle and bones. What's your recommendation? I think we need more than is recommended. Um, I'm a very physically active person. And if I was to eat 40 grams a day, which is the, the recommendation for women, then I would be really struggling and I wouldn't be building any any muscle. So for, phys you know, for physically active people, I think at least one gram per kilogram body weight. So, you know, I weigh um, about, you know, 63 kilos. So the minimum that I would have would be 63 a day. But if you're doing a lot of exercise, you can get up to about 1.2, 1.5. Mm -hmm. So I would say for a woman who is wanting to build um, 
build muscle, be physically active between about 60 and 80 um, grams a day of protein and spread it out throughout the day as well. And uh, don't just have it all in one go. I use um, protein bars. So mm -hmm. I have a, a, a bar that contains about anything between 10 and 20 grams of protein per bar. And I would have one a day, usually after an exercise session. I also think for elderly people, they do need to have enhanced protein as well. Elderly people are less able to absorb nutrients because of the effects of aging. And so they need more of a top up and more of a boost. Uh, so I would actually suggest um, giving extra protein to elderly. You know, things like eggs mm. are really good. You get six grams of protein in an egg. Things like um, Greek yogurt is high in protein and you can get fortified yogurts too. Uh, if you've got an elderly relative, maybe doesn't have a very good appetite, maybe something like um, um, a protein shake is a good way of getting extra protein in. But spread it out across the day so your body can use it, use it all rather than having it in one one big meal. What should we be doing in terms of exercise, do you think? Um, you know, for, for how long and which forms of exercise are best? How long depends on how much exercise you've done in the past. So if you're new to exercise, you don't want to be starting with an hour a day. When I am properly training, and I have actually been, um, I had an operation earlier this year, so I've taken a bit of time to get back to it. But when I'm properly trained and I'm in my late 50s, I would do uh, about an hour of exercise a day. And that could be um, a CrossFit session. So I usually go to CrossFit three or four times a week. And then I run on top of that. So that sort of makes up my six to seven sessions of exercise a week. Or I might play tennis um, on my day off. So I'll have kind of six days of, of training and one day when I might do something like tennis, um, swimming or Going, just going for a walk so I would never actually spend an entire day with no exercise whatsoever so with the CrossFit exercise it's a combination of cardiovascular and also weight training and before anybody says oh I'm far too old for weight training weight training is absolutely essential for people of all ages um, because it maintains your muscle mass builds your muscle mass and helps your strength and balance. So functional fitness is all about things like um, Olympic weightlifting. You'll do deadlifts. You'll maybe push press above your head. You also do some cardiovascular, such as burpees. Um, sight, you do a stationary bike. You do a ski machine. And then some gymnastic movements as well. So hanging from the rig, bands, um, you know, things to assist you to do things like pull-ups. Uh, you do press-ups as well. Everything, absolutely everything can be scaled. So I have people in my exercise class. I've got a, a man in his 70s who's recovering from cancer treatment. Um, my daughter, who's 14, does CrossFit. My son, who's 23, is absolutely brilliant at CrossFit, but he he does like the full works. He can do like handstand walking and everything. Mm. But, you know, there's you, you can scale absolutely everything. So it shouldn't put anybody off. Um, if you're just starting off, I would actually suggest getting down your gym and getting a little bit of personal training just to work you through different movements and then get a program that you can then follow. But you definitely need to then combine it with either um, jogging, running, cycling, or even even just getting a, a, a minimum amount of steps on your on your watch. So I would say something like 10 to 12,000 steps a day of walking just so you've got the weight training and also you have some cardiovascular, which helps with your weight management and your heart health as well. OK. And do you know, um, I mean, is is impact in terms of jumping or running or something like that, is the impact in itself helpful for bones? Yes, the, the impact is the stimulus for the bones mm -hmm. to help your bones to build strength and, and mass. So people might say, oh, but I swim, you know, three times a week and they'll drive to the pool, they'll get into the pool, they'll swim and then they'll drive home again. That's not giving your bones any impact at all. So it's it's good for muscles and it's good for cardiovascular, but it isn't actually giving you the stimulus. And if you can't face something like running, you know, dancing, Skipping, the skipping is a, a fantastic exercise and you can buy a, a, a skipping rope for a couple of pounds and just sort of jump up and down in your garden. So, I mean, that's good for bone health. And obviously walking, 
because you you put you're having the impact on your bones when you're walking i think that's one that a lot of people might be missing actually i mean i know i, I do do a fair amount of walking um but just haven't factored in anything like jumping or skipping because i'm trying to you know i've got dodgy knees so i'm trying to sort of minimize the impact of them whereas i i should actually be building that in you could build in your if if your knee is obviously if you if your knee is due to cartilage loss and it needs some medical intervention then you need to you need to go down that route but you can do things like squats you know so um you, they've done studies where uh, they've got more osteoporosis in america than china despite the Americans um, eating about three times more calcium than the Chinese. But when you look at squatting, Chinese people can sit down on their haunches in a squat and hold it for a lot longer than Americans can. Yeah. So it just shows that the Chinese are just being, you know, even though they have lower calcium intakes because it's the Chinese diet isn't is doesn't actually have any dairy products in it. And actually they tend to have a high amount of lactose intolerance in Asian countries. Nevertheless, the Chinese are cycling more, walking more, and when they sit in, in their homes, they often just crouch down and sit. So they're they're building bone mass strength and flexibility and um, you can either do air squats where you're squatting down uh, it's as if you're going to sit down in a chair and then stand back up again um, and then you can build it up to holding uh, a weight in front of you so kettlebells are really easy and cheap to buy on the internet now so squatting with holding a, a kettlebell in front of you or even a couple of cans of beans it's a good way to to do squats and also things like lunges. I'm quite a, a fan of of walking lunges. In fact, I'm building myself back to walking lunges again after my operation, and um, I've been just been doing them around the house. So just sort of walking and going into a lunge with the knee touching the the carpet, and then standing back up again and build it up from ten right up to fifty, um, and that can be done at home. So there's actually quite a lot of things you can do at home. And even checking on the internet, because I'm amazed how many free videos there are if you do things like building bone strength at home, you know, with your, your squats and your lunges and, and weight training. There's loads of videos that people can access now if they don't want to go to a gym or pay for a gym. Yeah, absolutely. It's very accessible, isn't it? Um, can I switch briefly to HRT? Because you, you talked about oestrogen. Um, and obviously that being a major contributor to osteoporosis during our kind of menopausal years. Do you have a particular view on HRT for bone health or is that a, an area you like to steer clear of? <laughs> I personally think that HRT is a really good thing. I saw a study a few years ago which said that they had postmenopausal women doing weight training and the group that were on HRT found it much easier to build muscle mass than the group who were not on HRT. So it's not about, just about bone health, it's about muscle health and function as well. Um, I'm, uh, I'm fine about taking HRT. The only worries that some women might have is about um, increased risk of breast cancer. And I understand that um, if you have a very strong family history of breast cancer, it's worth having a chat with your GP before going on to HRT. But my GP, when I went to chat to her about going on to HRT, actually said that the concerns about breast cancer had greatly lessened now with the new forms of the drugs. And once the doctors understood that it wasn't all breast cancer, it was just particular types that were hormone sensitive. So I think that it's worth every single woman who is interested in this to go and speak to their GP, talk about their family history and get the right medication for them. Because otherwise, I, I just think, well, why should we do without? You know, if, if it actually benefits our bodies to have those hormones, because we've had them for years and then suddenly we don't have them anymore. Why wouldn't you want to take them? Because I certainly feel so much better. I was having um, not so much hot flushes, but I mean, at night I would just wake up repeatedly and feel hot, then cold, then hot, then cold, 
all night long and I was I was just dragging myself out of bed in the morning and also I had a lot of the psychological symptoms where you worry incessantly about things you know I would lie in my bed at night worrying that the house was going to go on fire and then I'd say why am I worrying about fires you know it's just ridiculous so that you do get feelings of anxiety as well on the menopause and I found that since getting onto my HRT and getting used to it all those symptoms have gone and I feel absolutely fine. I think the attitudes that the medical profession and society has had towards women's health over the you know the last hundred years has been one of women should be stoical and shouldn't get help and support for things. So if you think about childbirth, you know, <laughs> it used to be like, oh, well, you know, you don't want to have any pain relief and you know, you, you should just do it naturally. Otherwise, you're, you know, you you haven't had a proper birth or, you know, you've got to do everything naturally. I mean, if men had to put up with the pain that we have to have during childbirth, they'd be running straight down to the doctors. Please, please give me something now. You know, I don't see why women should always have to put up with things. Yeah. Yeah. If, there's, um, if there's remedies out there that are going to help women at all ages of their life to, to kind of put up with some of the things that we have to put up with in terms of menstrual cycle and menopause and childbirth, these are things that men don't experience. And if there's things out there that can help, I think we should be allowed to get it and shouldn't be made to feel guilty about it. Yeah, absolutely. And we know so much more now about how to uh, mitigate risks and offset risks with lifestyle as well. M much of what we've talked about today um, can can help reduce our, our risks of age-related diseases. So, no, I think that's really good advice. Um, last question. Uh, again, it's a bit of a personal one. I just wondered your take on this because I obviously explore how to age well and I come across a lot of the, the biohackers out there uh, listening to them on podcasts um, and you know some of the advice that's coming out now it makes my head spin you know because people say such different things but I've heard in particular recently um, some more extreme diets in terms of people following carnivore diets animal only products and, and people almost kind of demonizing plant foods as well, including things like almonds, you know, nuts and and so on, um, saying they contain anti-nutrients, which affect how we absorb uh, nutrients and minerals. I mean, when you hear this as a nutritionist, what do you think? I just feel that people are making misery for themselves because life is about balance. It's about having opportunities to try different things. And I think that it creates a very narrow frame of mind. It almost becomes like a religion mm. where you've got to bash everybody else for not following the same diet as you. My take on it is always to have a very wide variety of foods because that's the way that humans are designed. I've got the same body. Um, that a woman would have had 15,000 years ago. So I've got a, a cave woman body and that means that I need to have some plants, I need to have some fibre, I need to have some meat and animal products because of the fat and the fat-soluble vitamins and the protein. Um, I need all of those things and I'm not going to deny myself. And because I'm a, a modern woman who, who likes a bit of Turkish delight sometimes, I'm going to have some, but I'm going to make sure that I limit it because it's very high in sugar and calories and I'm going to take lots of physical activity. So I actually think people should be embracing life and having more variety, not less variety. Yeah. Saying that, I think it can quite often help in the modern world when we're all rushing about and maybe don't always have time to cook the perfect um, meals for ourselves to take just a, a multivit, multimineral. And um, that's something that I recommend if you're you know, a busy person that doesn't always have time to to buy and cook the kinds of foods you think your body needs. But that's almost like an insurance policy. It's not there to replace the varied balanced diet. But anyway, I just think, you know, don't restrict yourself unnecessarily. I really don't think you're going to give yourself a huge advantage um, in terms of your health. You probably get more of an advantage going out for a really brisk walk, having a hearty, balanced meal and enjoying good conversation with people that you like being with. Yeah, I think that'll be a lot, uh, a relief for a lot of people to hear, having listened to the many voices out there, just, just a voice of reason in the mix um and you mentioned supplements there we did talk about vitamin d um and you you mentioned it's a good idea to take a multivitamin is there anything else in particular 
uh, for bone health you think we should be looking at in supplement form? No, I mean if you if you have if you have fractures and you you have perhaps osteoporosis in your family, it doesn't do any harm to take additional calcium as well. So the studies that I've seen have been up to fifteen hundred milligrams of calcium a day. The normal recommendation is between seven hundred and a thousand, but um, for postmenopausal women who have got a, a family history, I would say fifteen hundred um, milligrams of calcium. And then about 25 to 50 micrograms of vitamin D, which you'll need to take in supplement form because you won't be able to get that from foods. But again, find a dietitian near to you and chat it through with them. Many dietitians now will do online consultations so you don't even have to go to a clinic. But chat it through with a healthcare professional just so you get the right um, supplements for you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Carrie. Much appreciated. Good to talk to you, Claire. So what I found really enlightening about Dr. Carey's advice there is the idea of banking bone density from as young an age as possible. And I think that's a really important message for both ourselves and our children as well. Last week, I talked through the results of one of the biggest studies covering almost 500,000 people around the best diet for life and health span. And the findings there echo what we've just heard today. As always, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this topic. Is bone health a big priority for you? I've got to say that as I head towards 51, it has shot up my list of priorities as I become even more focused on diet and exercise. And if you found this discussion helpful, then by hitting subscribe, you'll have access to all my latest content as soon as it's published. And by hitting the like button, you'll help this video reach even more people. I share more advice and information on how to age well on my website, honest.scot. But for now, thanks for watching and listening, and I'll see you next time.